Hello my brothers, I made an iceberg. After spending too much time looking for an iceberg that only covered Japanese lost media, I couldn't find one. So I did what any reasonable person would do, I made one. This is my first time making an iceberg, so please forgive me if it feels unorganized or a bit trash. This iceberg contains all sorts of media originating from Japan that ended up lost somehow. Some of these entries are found, some are lost, some are partially lost, and some we don't even know if they exist or not. I tried to sort these entries based on a mix of how obscure they are and how many people on YouTube have covered them, which is why you'll see something like the Jeff the Killer image in the second tier, and some lost golfing game in the seventh tier. Sit back, relax, and get ready to listen to me ramble about lost media. We're gonna be here for a while. This first tier is titled The Normie. The entries found on this tier are common knowledge when it comes to lost media, and any person that has spent time on YouTube will most likely at least heard of some of these topics. Lost Pokemon episode. This entry refers to the original airing of the Pokemon's anime pilot that somehow managed to get lost for a while. Oh yeah, there's gonna be tons of anime on this iceberg, so be prepared. When the Pokemon anime went back on air in April 1998, just four months after they put hundreds of Japanese children in the hospital by showing tons of flashing lights, the animators edited the previous 37 episodes of the anime just to be safe. They slowed down all the flashing lights in every episode and never aired the original versions of the anime again, despite no reports of the episodes causing seizures for anyone. In 2012, the Pokemon anime was available to stream on Hulu in Japan through an exclusive streaming deal. The versions of the episode given to Hulu were the original broadcast version that originally aired in 1997 prior to the flashing lights incident. They were first made publicly available by a Pokemon fan group as an April Fool's joke in 2013. Episodes 2 to 37 were all available in their original broadcast format, but Hulu's copy of episode 1 however remained the edited version that has been seen on DVDs and other streaming platforms both in and outside of Japan since 2004. However, it turned out later that episode 1's original broadcast was never lost or missing in the first place and has been commercially available to the public since 1997. In November of 1997, the Japanese publisher Shogakukan released Pocket Monsters Volume 1 and Pocket Monsters Volume 2 as the first in a rental-only VHS line. These tapes were available to rent for just under a month before the incident with the flashing lights took place and thus contains the original broadcasted versions of the first six episodes. As these rental-only VHS tapes are widely forgotten about or not known about, this is what likely caused the spread of misinformation that the original broadcast versions only existed on Hulu outside of their original airing, and that episode 1 had been lost. The most commonly shared copy of episode 1's original broadcast was created by Pokemon Peru, a Facebook group. This version of the episode splices together a mix of footage from the released Hulu rips and splices in edited scenes taken from a real recording of the original broadcast. Since then, the search has come to an end, and the original airing of the first Pokemon episode is now found. Marine Kong. With the amount of Godzilla and other kaiju movies being released in the 50s, it's safe to say that Japan was in their giant monster phase. Due to the popularity of kaijus at the time, it's no wonder why Nissan Productions would want to get into the business. In 1959, Nissan Productions planned on producing a series called Great Sea Beast Gaborah. The series would feature a gigantic starfish monster as the main character. However, for unknown reasons, whether it be studio interventions or budget reasons, the series series would be cancelled. The following year, in 1960, Nissan decided on producing another show featuring a marine-based kaiju, this time for Fuji TV, which would become known as Marine Kong. The show would run for two 13-episode chapters in 1960. The show was only broadcasted in Japan and was rather successful at the time, drawing in fans of both Godzilla and King Kong. Despite how popular this series was back in the day, not even a single copy of an entire episode has surfaced online or in any other format, even though the show had a VH release in 1984. As of today, a portion of episode 2, a 6 minute video containing various clips, a full 30 second clip, the ending to one of the episodes, and a few screenshots and posters are all that's available. Due to the amount of lost content still yet to be discovered, Marine Kong is only partially found. Pokemate. 
Pokemate was a mobile game that was developed and published by Square Enix back in 2006. The game was pretty unique from other Pokemon games. It allowed players to capture Pokemon, chat with their friends and other players, and take care of their Pokemon in a virtual pet simulator mode. Not too dissimilar from the mini game found in Pokemon X and Y. Kinda like in Pokemon Go, the game would give a new player a small amount of Pokeballs to start with. And to get more, players would need to sign up to a service with a monthly fee of 200 yen to get more Pokeballs and in-game content. A main part of Pokemate was the chat room, which allowed different players' Pokemon to send messages between two players, and worked in a similar fashion to email. The game was only released in Japan, but during an E3, it was announced that Pokemate would see a wider release in 2008. Unfortunately, the Pokemate service was discontinued in Japan in 2008, and never ended up getting released to other parts of the world. Besides a few screenshots and a little bit of footage here and there, there's no way to access it since it was cancelled, and Pokemon mate remains lost. BS, The Legend of Zelda. Back in the days before mainstream internet, there was a system developed by Nintendo called the Saddle of You. It was essentially a modem that players would stick onto their Super Famicom to download games, magazines, and other various content. Soundlink games were special games broadcasted over the radio to Super Famicom systems with the use of the Saddle of You, along with a subscription to the Saint Giga radio service. Saint Giga being the company that worked with Nintendo to develop the Saddle of You. Games would be broadcast in weekly or in daily episodes, as new episodes were added, more and more of the game would become available. These games were not permanent and would be erased at the end of the broadcast period to make space for new games, due to the tiny size of storage available on the Saddle of You. Additionally, Soundlink games could only be played at set hours due to real-time narration being used. This makes the games impossible to obtain, as new broadcasts are not being sent out with the service being shut down in March of 2000. One of the most interesting Soundlink games that were lost was a game titled BS, The Legend of Zelda. The gameplay of this Soundlink game was identical to the original Legend of Zelda game. The player controlled a hero as they adventured throughout the overworld, fighting through dungeons, collecting shards of the Triforce, and ultimately fighting the final boss Ganon and rescuing Princess Zelda. While having identical gameplay, many differences exist between The Legend of Zelda and the Saddle of You game. For one thing, the graphics are 16-bit instead of 8-bit due to the game being on the Super Famicom. Also, you play as the Hero of Light, a different person than the normal protagonist of the Zelda series, Link. The Hero of Light is based on an avatar character from the Saddle of You account system. If you choose male, your character wears a white backward baseball cap, while females have a pink ponytail, with both characters wearing Link's signature green tunic. Due to being a sound Link game, BS The Legend of Zelda could only be played from 5pm to 7pm. The only known ROM dump of the game comes from the third week and is thus incomplete. However, by using videos of gameplay from the broadcast period, fans have been able to recreate the final week of the game, but due to the two lost weeks of BS Zelda, the game remains partially lost. Pokemon Crystal Version Pokemon Crystal Version was a Pokemon game for the Game Boy Color released in Japan in 2000, and in other countries in 2001. Pokemon Crystal took the story and the gameplay of the earlier released Pokemon Gold and Silver versions and enhanced them with new storyline additions, graphical and technical upgrades, and a few new game mechanics. However, while the gameplay was enhanced worldwide, the version released in Japan was definitely enhanced a lot more. In Japan, an accessory that was compatible with the Game Boy Color and the Game Boy Advance was released called the Mobile Adapter GB. It could be used to attach a player's Game Boy Color or Game Boy Advance to their mobile phone, allowing them to connect to the internet and engage in online multiplayer activities or download new content to their games. The Mobile Adapter GB was not released outside of Japan, likely due to the fact that at the time, cell phones outside Japan were neither as common nor as technically advanced as those in Japan. Pokemon Crystal was one of the several games compatible with the accessory. The Japanese version of the game has a Pokemon Communication Center in place of the Pokemon Center in Goldenrod City. Using the mobile adapter GB, players would go to this new center and battle and trade with other players across the nation using their mobile internet service. Downloadable content was also available. When data is downloaded, players can go to the center to receive it. The DLC included items such as the GS Ball, Blue Sky Mail, and Mirage Mail, as well as news about other players who use the online service, viewable on the Pokemon News Machine. There were also a couple of exclusive minigames, including Chieko Dice and a 10-card quiz, hosted by a time-traveling girl named Chieko. 
Dialogue for NPCs would also be changed depending on download updates. Most of these services had fees attached to them, with Pokemon News having a monthly fee of 100 yen. Additionally, the service could change the battle tower, and data for timed mobile battles could be transferred to the Nintendo 64 game, Pokemon Stadium 2, via the Nintendo 64 transfer pack. Unfortunately, the mobile service shut down in December of 2002, due to limited commercial success and low user traffic. This meant that no new updates were available, and access to DLC was impossible. Data that was downloaded from the service was stored in the game's RAM, which was backed up by a battery. Batteries of Pokemon games are known to drain relatively quickly, more so in Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal versions, due to the fact that the battery supports an in-game clock that is constantly running even when the game isn't being used. This means that when the battery dies, the mobile data is erased as well as the save data. This makes the possibility of any mobile patches still existing on any cartridge very unlikely. Due to this, the version of Pokemon Crystal that was enhanced by this mobile service still remains lost to this day. Domino's app featuring Hatsune Miku. Hello everyone, I'm Scott, president of Domino's Pizza. Have you heard of Hatsune Miku? Today I'd like to announce a new collaborative project featuring Hatsune Miku. Domino's app featuring Hatsune Miku. I'm sorry, I just, I had to talk about this. Domino's app featuring Hatsune Miku is a discontinued app formally released on March 7th, 2013. It was a collaboration with Domino's and Hatsune Miku, you know, the, the Vocaloid Hatsune Miku. Unfortunately, the app ended up being discontinued, rendering it unavailable for download. The reason this masterpiece is so well known and epic is because of this infamous video created to promote the app. Thankfully, the YouTuber Nick Robertson ended up finding the lost app. He bought an iPhone 5 from eBay and found the app on his old iCloud account. With the help of two coders, they eventually found a way to release the app again, rendering Domino's app featuring Hatsune Miku found. Grand Theft Auto, Sega Saturn. Grand Theft Auto, Sega Saturn was a planned port of the first Grand Theft Auto game onto, you guessed it, the Sega Saturn. Due to the series gaining popularity, Rockstar Games wanted to port the game to all of the consoles that were on the market at the time. The port was due to release in December of 1996. Despite Grand Theft Auto being planned to have a Sega Saturn port with an announcement in Sega Power magazine, the sales for the Sega Saturn were not that good. This caused Rockstar Games to cancel the port of Grand Theft Auto to the Sega Saturn. Another reason why Rockstar Games dropped the port was to focus on the PC version of the game, which was probably a good idea. No prototypes or betas of the Sega Saturn version have been given to the public, and very little other information is known about the port, rendering the game lost. The second tier of this iceberg is titled The Average Kappa Dance Watcher. The entries found on this tier will be known to those that spend their time watching YouTube channels such as Kappa Dance and other Lost Media YouTubers. All the entries on this tier have already been covered in immense detail by multiple YouTubers and have either been found or unconfirmed whether or not they exist. The origin of Jeff the Killer. The well-known creepypasta and the source of a lot of my childhood trauma, Jeff the Killer is a noseless and pale-faced man with no eyelids and black loops around his eyes. When I was a child, I was scared shitless of this guy. I would always have my curtains shut at night no matter what, just in case he decided to appear at my window. Jeff the Killer became quite famous from this image that was often used as an internet screamer. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I, I never got jump scared by this guy as a kid. <laughs> no, not even once. The image that's used to portray Jeff the Killer is supposedly a composite of someone's unedited face, of which is unknown, but is believed to have once existed on the internet. Even to this day, I can't look at this image without getting chills. Like while, while editing this, I've been squinting my eyes. Something about the image is just so off-putting, I guess. There's two known widespread versions of the early Jeff the Killer image. The earlier variant uses different eyes and a non-distorted smile compared to the second and more famous edit. Both variants could be seen on numerous Japanese image boards throughout the mid-2000s, before even being associated with Jeff the Killer. The reason this is on the lost Japanese media iceberg is because the first known appearance of this picture, or more accurately the earlier version of it, was from a Japanese media sharing site. It was accompanied by the caption, a certain 
celebrity before plastic surgery. Some of the comments mentioned seeing the image on other sites, suggesting that there were previous posts, but they can't be found. This image then had a popularity surge on the Japanese image board 2chan, where users would spam the image in hopes to scare people, which I can tell you from experience, um, to scare people, it, it did. There's so many different theories about the image's origin that have been disproven that I won't be covering here, as there's way too many to talk about. If you think you know where the image comes from, Go hit up Mudaha from Some Ordinary Gamers. He's willing to pay a shit ton of money for the original image. Hito Gata, ah, the, the one you've all been waiting for. Hito Gata is an urban legend dating back to 2004 on the image board 2chan. Users believe that this piece of media is either a PSA shown in schools or a commercial that aired late at night. Testimonies and eyewitnesses accounts vary heavily. But the general premise stays the same. The sound of a railroad crossing sign rings in the background as two white, featureless human figures appear on the screen. When one figure fades out, another fades in. The text is displayed on the screen, with some reports of a narrator saying that every two seconds, someone dies on Earth. Originating in 2004, numerous recreation videos have been made depicting these two white, featureless figures. Despite numerous search efforts, the commercial has not been found and still remains an urban legend. Personally, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure this thing doesn't exist. I mean, people have been searching for it for almost two decades and nothing has been found. But hey, you, you never know, I guess. With the amount of recent videos covering the topic, the search actually might lead to something. Saki Sanobashi. I've already made two videos on this, but the second one was deleted because, well, YouTube. But the first one is still up if you're curious. Saki Sanobashi, also known as Go For A Punch, is a lost OVA from the late 1980s or early 1990s. According to the original rumor, the OVA is 20 minutes long and features nine high school girls trapped in a bathroom with no doors and windows, and they all eventually commit, um, unalive in gruesome gruesome ways. Most people believe that the original post was just a troll and the anime doesn't exist. This is further backed up by a semi-recent post from a person claiming to be the original poster, saying it was just a dumb joke and the anime never existed. Despite this, myself and tons of other people still continue the search and hope that one day we find something. At the end of the day, it's okay if it doesn't exist. A bunch of other lost media has been found while looking for it and so many friendships have been made. In the end, the Saki Sanobashi was the friends we made along the way. McDonald's E-Crew In 2010, McDonald's Japan collaborated with Nintendo to create the E-Crew development program, a Nintendo DS game designed to train new employees. The game received some media coverage, but it was only given to McDonald's Japan employees and required an individual password to play. In December of 2018, a thread was started on the Assembler Games website by the user Code1038, who had bought the game cartridge years earlier. Code1038 was stuck on a password entry page and could not progress past that point, as he had no way of figuring out the copy's individualized password. In mid-2020, a Yahoo Japan auction for the game appeared online. Its starting price was 400,000 yen, about $4,000 US, which was later lowered. Upon the inspection of the game's code, Code 1038 was able to figure out the password for his copy and uploaded a full playthrough to YouTube on October 30th, 2020. Despite having full access to the game and its password, Code 1038 made it clear that he had no intention of dumping the game and distributing it to the public. On November 18th, 2020, YouTube YouTuber Nick Robinson shared a video where he revealed that he was the winner of the Yahoo auction. After playing the game on a live stream, he then dumped the entire game and uploaded it onto the Internet Archive, rendering the game found. The Warped Forest Asate no Mori, or The Warped Forest in English, is a 2011 art film directed by Shunichiro Miki. It's a spiritual sequel to the 2005 film Funky Forest, which Miki directed alongside Katsuhito Ishii and Hajime Ishimine, neither of which were involved in the making of The Warped Forest. Much like its predecessor, The Warped Forest appears to be a collection of strange stories and scenes centered around human interactions with otherworldly objects and characters. Looking at this 
trailer, it's clear how wacky and bonkers this movie is. The film was screened at various art house film festivals, including a handful of international releases with English subtitles. These include screenings at Fantastic Fest 2012 in Austin and at the New York Japan Society in 2013. Despite widespread international screenings, the film has never been released on DVD in any country, including Japan. For years, there was no way to watch this film until November of 2021, when the full movie was uploaded to Mega by the user Flashfire42, rendering the film found. Oso Matsukun. Oso Matsukun was a very popular Japanese anime that ran from the 1960s to the 1980s and centered around the wacky adventures of the Matsuno sex tuplets. Based on the comedy manga by Fujio Akasuka, the show was popular and reran in both Japan and South Korea. Due to the poor storage of the original footage and audio, it was believed that the 1966 anime was entirely missing from the archives sometime after the 1970s reruns ended and could never be broadcast on television or released on video. Nowadays, the Otsu Matsukun series is relatively easy to find, as it was released on both VHS and DVD, and volumes can be purchased from Japan via Amazon rendering the status of this lost anime found. We are now onto the third tier of the iceberg, titled The Internet Sleuth. Entries found on this tier will be known only to those who have spent a considerable amount of time on the internet, researching and discussing topics such as lost media. Goku and Frieza go to KFC, the movie. Yes, this is a real movie that was made. Goku and Frieza from the hit anime series Dragon Ball Z do, in fact, go to the famous fried chicken restaurant KFC in a movie. Goku and Frieza go to KFC, the movie, is a direct-to-DVD movie based off the Dragon Ball Z cinematic universe and the fast food chain KFC. Being released in 2004, this movie was a straight-to-DVD release. The plot of the movie is mostly unknown as no footage of the film has been recovered. Some people who have claimed to have seen it say that the plot takes place just after Goku defeats Frieza in the anime. Goku wanted to celebrate by going to KFC. However, Frieza hated KFC as he was a taco bella. There is said to be a scene where Goku cheats on KFC and eats some Popeye's chicken. This has not been confirmed, however. The reason I love this so much is because there's no information out there other than this screenshot proving the existence of the movie. But at the same time, there's no information out there disproving its existence. Due to lost media technicalities, this film is not considered fake. It's considered lost. I think that would explain why this movie was taken down from the lost media wiki. I honestly wouldn't be surprised if this movie existed. I mean, just watch this Dragon Ball KFC ad. If this ad is real, then this movie can be real. We need to find this movie. I need to know what Goku ordered at KFC. I will not be able to rest until I acquire this information. Noah's Ark. Alright, no, I'm sorry. The, the next one's not a shit post. it's an actual thing. Noah's Ark is a lost 1995 Windows Mac adventure game linked to the company NEC. Very little is known about the game, but from the screenshots and brief description we have, the game seems to be a mystery style point and click adventure game. A sold listing with photographs of the game's box from several angles was discovered on Yahoo Auctions Japan, thus confirming the game's existence. Using the Wayback Machine, two archives of the game's website were found, one in English and one in Japanese. According to the Japanese version of the site, Kenichi Shigeto and Kazuhiro Nishimatsu worked on the game as an artist and a composer respectively, and they seem to have credits on other projects related to their stated fields. The screenshots shown on the English version of the website suggest that the game was at least partially in English. The GUI in the screenshots has English text. However, it's unknown if the game originally had English text on the GUI, or if it had been translated into English, as the GIF file pulled from the Japanese version of the website is too low resolution to determine the language of the text. On December 31st, 2021, a user on the Lost Media Wiki called Saint posted the game's trailer from a cover disc of a 1996 issue of the Japanese gaming magazine called Digital Boy. On February 9th, 2021, Saint posted two scans from a 1995 issue of Game Blast magazine to the Lost Media Wiki forms. These articles contained previously unseen screenshots. According to a translation done by Saint, the game was originally slated for release on October 5th, 1995. On March 28th, 2023, Lost Media Wiki form user Tenacious Nix uploaded two scans of issue 20 of Logon Magazine from October 1995. According to the user's translation, 
These scans include a brief walkthrough of some of the game's puzzles, as well as an overview of the game's interface. The scan also has a bit of new info about the story, such as the fact that the player has an AI companion. Other than these scans uploaded onto the Lost Media Wiki and the one website that people found, and the Yahoo auction, we don't really have much information on the game. Just looking at the cover art, you can tell this game is something special. It looks so unique and eerie looking until a copy of the game turns up. It's likely that Noah's Ark will remain lost. Okiku Naruko Okiku Naruko, or in English, Children Growing Up, was an educational Japanese show produced by Studio Nova that aired on NHK through April of 1959 to March of 1988. It was created for first and second year primary students in Japan, teaching them lessons like morals and how to act at school. The show is most notable for the monkey puppet meme, portrayed by the main protagonist Pedro. In the 1980s and the 90s, the series was also aired in Latin America under the name Ninos en Sedimento, I am not Spanish, I don't know if I said that right. This was the penultimate season of the show, airing from April 13th, 1984 to April 4th, 1986 in Japan. Outside multiple clips of the show when it aired in Latin America, only one clip of the Japanese version of the show has ever surfaced, and the Japanese version of it still remains lost. Which is Lunchbox Factory? Witch's Lunchbox Factory was a commercial from 2001 that was aired by AMPM, a chain of convenience stores in the United States, during its expansion in Japan. The commercial was intended to promote AMPM's original Japanese product, Frozen Toretate Bento. The commercial shows a bento factory controlled by a witch, where a large amount of preservative powder is poured over the bento. The commercial ended with a voiceover saying, AMPM's freshly made lunchboxes are preservative free. The commercial aired on TBS early in the morning on February 6, 2001, but was cancelled later that day after the Japan Franchise Association requested that it refrain from airing the commercial on the grounds that it was misleading to consumers. The commercial was discussed for a long time on the Japanese message board 5chan, but the video was finally found on January 28, 2022, when a person in possession of the recorded video suddenly appeared on the thread. Yeah Yeah Beebus 1 Yeah Yeah Beebus 1 is a potentially non-existent video game that was first mentioned in June 1989, listing for the mail order video game service Play It Again in an issue of video games and computer entertainment. The game was then found again in subsequent advertisements from Play It Again in July, August and September. Additionally, in October, a nearly identical advertisement was placed in another mail order video game service called Funko. These also had a listing for the game, shortened to Yeah Beebus 1, though despite the shortening, Yeah Beebus 1 was still wrongly alphabetized between WrestleMania and Xenophobe, just as it had been in Play It Again. Listings continued until January 1990. Nothing further surfaced about Beebus after this time, and as such, it's unknown if the game was simply a bad translation, a placeholder, or even a game at all. There's countless theories behind what it was. It's alleged that the game was fabricated as a copyright trap, intended to serve as evidence if other game services copied the list. It's also alleged due to its peculiar title that the game was fabricated in order to account for blank space in its respective section. The most believable theory in my opinion was that it was just a butchered translation of a localized name. McDonald's TV commercials. On the 20th of July, 1971, the fast food restaurant chain McDonald's had finally reached the Asian shores at the Ginza branch of the Mitsukoshi department store in Tokyo, Japan, and the first television commercial was aired on Japanese television in 1971. While the commercials from 1977 onward are available on the internet, the earlier commercials which originally aired between 1973 and 1976 can't be found anywhere. Several people who have seen the commercials at the time state that they were bizarre, comedic live-action ads which didn't quite look like they were advertising for restaurants. One of the commercials seemed to involve Ronald McDonald rowing a wooden boat on the river, but it quickly lands on the shore without Ronald noticing. There are possibilities that there is no recorded footage of the commercials due to many people in Japan at the time not owning any recording media other than cassette tapes which were only capable of recording sound. However, due to the fact that the Japanese branch of McDonald's has the data for the air date of the first commercial, it's likely that the company owns the original print. Gyakushan Saihanri 
Yokushan Saihanri is an Ace Attorney fan game released in 2003 and was made by a guy called Cheshire. The game stars anthropomorphic animal characters, three of them who resemble furry versions of Phoenix Wright characters, while all of the other characters appear to be original. Plot elements are reminiscent of the original Ace Attorney games, such as a murderer in the opening scene with the perpetrator desperately preparing to frame someone else, or an antagonist wearing an electronic red shiny eyepiece. Graphics are directly based on the original games, but the music is original, possibly due to copyright issues. In spite of this, the game's elements are derivative enough to make YouTube Gaming identify the footage as the original Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney game. There is footage of the game on YouTube, but it's unknown if it's the full gameplay or just the first part. An uploader claims there are no more playable copies of the game available. For quite a while, the game was thought to be completely lost, but on October 6, 2021, the Lost Media Wiki user, Scar, announced that they had found the game, having gotten it by a Japanese furry. Scar later posted the game onto the Internet Archive, rendering the game found. But at what cost? At what cost? The next tier of the iceberg is the fourth tier, titled The Lost Media Enthusiast. Entries on this tier will be known to those that regularly browse the Lost Media Wiki for fun and take part in online searches for media that has been lost to time. Cyborg Kudo-chan Cyborg Kudo-chan was an anime that ran from October 2nd, 1999 to January 6th, 2001 in Japan. There was a total of 66 episodes created, though episode 66, the final episode that was produced, was never seen outside of Japan. The episode aired on January 6, 2001 and has never been seen since. The show has never been released on DVD or Blu-ray due to licensing issues, as the producers of the show went bankrupt during its production. The companies behind the anime, Studio Bogey and Public and Basic, closed in December of 2000, and since the episode aired after their closure, it's very possible that the only people that have copies of the episode are the Japanese distributors. The episode was gone, completely lost, until April 2nd, 2016, when the Japanese anime channel ATX aired the episode. A day later, the episode was uploaded to YouTube, however the upload has since been taken down. Later that year, a Japanese kids-oriented YouTube channel uploaded the entire series, including episode 66. The channel is linked to the company that owns the rights to Kuro-chan in Japan. However, the uploads were a limited time promotion and are all private now. The episodes were later mirrored to the internet archive, and episode 66 is now permanently available to the public, making this episode found. Nickelodeon Japan during the 90s, the Nickelodeon brand was doing super well in the US, with shows such as Spongebob and The Fairly Odd Parents absolutely popping off. Because of this, Viacom wanted to broadcast Nickelodeon programming to a wider audience and started to launch Nickelodeon channels around the world. Nickelodeon Japan ended up launching in November 1998 to introduce Nickelodeon programming for a Japanese audience. The network aired many of Nickelodeon's programs between 1998 and 2009, dubbed in the Japanese language. Yes, that is correct. SpongeBob has a Japanese dub. On September 30th, 2009, the same day that Nickelodeon internationally changed their logo and branding, Nickelodeon Japan went off air due to declining viewership. I guess Japanese children have better things to do than watch Mr. Meaty. What a, what a surprise. What's been saved from Nickelodeon Japan are recordings of the channel, as well as wayback captures of Nickelodeon Japan's website from around 2006. Between 2009 and 2018, several of Nickelodeon's shows instead aired on other channels, such as Disney XD, NHK, Hulu Japan, DTV Channel Japan, and Prime Video. SpongeBob SquarePants immediately moved over to MTV Japan, and later Animax, under a new block called Nick Time. There's three videos that are currently available and are rumored to be footage of the channel's shutdown. At least two of these videos have been confirmed to be real, leaving one of them disproven. Calimero Calimero was a cartoon about a black chicken with a half eggshell hat. Originally created in 1963 as a character for advertising soap, he became widely popular in his home country of Italy. KNS, a Japanese company, caught wind of Calimero's fame, and in the early 70s, bought the rights to the character. They soon contacted Toei Animation to make an animated series based on Calimero, and in October of 1974, the first episode aired through Net Network, with the final episode airing in September of 1975. The show would be dubbed into many different European languages in its lifetime, however the original Japanese audio remains to be some of the most elusive among fans. Episodes of the 1974 series have been dubbed in 
European languages, as well as Arabic, and can be found online pretty easily. However, the series' original Japanese audio is very hard to find. Unlike the 1992 Calimero anime, no known VHS or DVD releases of the 1974 series have been released with the original Japanese audio. There were 45 episodes made for the show. Unlike most anime, most episodes were split into two 11-minute segments, with each segment having their own unique title. 24 of the 45 episodes have currently been found. In September 2018, a user known as Yuriko uploaded episodes 17 to 19 and later various others in Japanese on YouTube. Sometime between September of 2018 and March of 2019, his channel was terminated, leaving the episodes no longer available. However, thankfully they were all saved and re-uploaded on OneDrive by the Lost Media Wiki user Christo Ham. As of now, 20 out of the 45 episodes still remain lost. Before Crisis Final Fantasy VII Before Crisis Final Fantasy VII was a mobile action role-playing game for the FOMA service in Japan. This game was a part of the compilation of Final Fantasy VII. It was developed by Square Enix and was released for FOMA in 2004 and would only be playable through a subscription to Square Enix's mobile service called Final Fantasy Mobile. Square Enix announced that the service for Final Fantasy Mobile would end on March 31st, 2018. It also stated that the Final Fantasy Mobile membership in information and installed apps would not be available. This would mean that even having the game installed on the phone after this date, it would still not start up. Due to this, the game remains completely lost, and it's quite unlikely that it will be found anytime soon, without the help of Square Enix themselves. Tokyo 1960 Tokyo 1960 was a Filipino kaiju film released on the 27th of December 1957. The movie is basically the Filipino version of Godzilla and is often described as the mightiest melodrama of them all. It was claimed to be shot in Tokyo, but it was really shot in Manila, the capital of the Philippines. The film splices together some footage of Godzilla to create a new but similar narrative. It was produced in 1956 and was released in 1957. There is a relative relatively recent blog post by a person that claims that its international name was Godzilla's Fury and also Godzilla 1960 and said to have collaborated with Toho Films in Japan. The first mention of the movie was in 2008 when Video 48 mentioned it on their three atomic monster movies in the 1950s list. This gained attention of the classic horror film board when the user Dr. Kiss made a thread about the movie containing significant new information. However, it is still unknown if the movie is a redub or re-edit of the original Godzilla movie, or is a completely different film. Regardless of this, the film still remains lost. The next tier of this iceberg is the fifth tier. It's titled Addicted to the Internet. Entries on this tier will be known to those who have a severe and crippling internet addiction and refuse to step away from their computer. Daibutsu Kaikoku. Daibutsu Kaikoku, also known by its longer translated title, The Giant Buddha Statues Travel Through the Country, is one of Japan's earliest kaiju films, coming out at around the same time as the King Kong movies. It was also the final film to be directed and produced by Yoshiro Edemasa, a longtime director of early 1900s Japanese cinema. The plot focuses on a giant Buddha statue, 33 meters in height. It comes to life and tours the country, mainly seeing tourist sites, before flying into the clouds and going to Tokyo. Known only by some descriptions in magazines, the movie had a few notable scenes including the statue resting while a geisha girl dances in his palm. It also had some color sequences taking place in heaven and hell. The premise of this movie is really, really funny to me. Unlike Godzilla, a movie where a giant radioactive lizard destroys Tokyo, this movie follows a Buddha statue just walking around Japan, seeing tourist attractions. Very cool. Planned to be the start of a multi-film series, the movie was only shown in a limited number of theatres and has since been lost. According to some people who worked on the film, the only copy they had got destroyed during World War II. The only known images from the movie are from a magazine article. Unfortunately, this masterpiece of a film will likely remain lost till the end of time. Dr. Zen 
Dr. Zen, also known as Kaito Pride, is a Japanese anime series from 1965 produced by Japanese telecartoons. The show is comprised of around 100 mini episodes that aired on weekdays from May 31st to November 4th, 1965. Each episode featured a part of the story in which a detective tries to hunt down and capture a notorious and narcissistic thief. This series aired daily, Monday to Friday, in eight minute segments to complete a single story by the end of the week. While the original Japanese series is lost, an American remake was also cancelled during development. As such, a few episodes were remade, and six of these have been uploaded to YouTube, but the bulk of the series is still not found. Other than this, there's no other information I could find on it. This anime seems to be forgotten about and abandoned, aside from the American remake. You too. The Zoo TV Tour was a series of concerts by the band U2 between the years of 1992 and 1993 that served as their live promotion of their albums, Akhtang Baby and Zuropa, released in 1991 and 1993 respectively. But this tour was also memorable because of the fact that the stage used various screens that displayed different images and also TV channels depending on which country they were playing in at the time with the help of satellite. Also, the lead singer Bono played two characters every night on stage, which would picture a fictionalized idea of a rock star at the peak of their career and then their downfall when fame practically corrupts them. They would be The Fly, and for the encores it would be Mirrorball Man in 1992 and Mr. Mephesto in 1993. Yeah, Bono is, um, is a wacky guy. I got no idea what any of this stuff means. This was one of U2's most famous tours, and for the beginning of the 90s, what they would do with the stage work would be a pretty innovative thing, which would also continue their subsequent tour, Pop Mart, which would use one of the world's biggest screens as part of the stage. The tour began in February of 1992 in Lakeland, Florida, and ended in December 1993 in Tokyo, Japan, with two shows at the Tokyo Dome, Japan's biggest venue on the 19th and 10th of that month. The two final concerts at the Tokyo Dome are considered to be entirely lost, as there's complete audio from both nights in the form of bootlegs, along with a video of Bono and The Edge being interviewed as the stage is being built behind them, and they're pretty easy to find. But when it comes to pictures and footage of the actual show itself, it's very unlikely to come across any. The collage that shows some stills from the broadcast is the only proof that footage from these shows actually exists, but only time will tell if it ever surfaces or will be uploaded by someone. Panel de Pond 64 Panel de Pond 64 was an unreleased Nintendo 64 puzzle game developed by Intelligent Systems and was planned to be published by Nintendo. It was intended to be a sequel to the 1995 Super Famicom game Panel de Pond that was also released outside of Japan as Tetris Attack. Panel de Pond, the original, is actually such an underrated game. You can actually play it on the Nintendo Switch subscription service and it's Pretty fun. The music in it is also really, really good. The existence of Panel de Pond 64 has been rumored several times on different message boards from 2009 to 2013, but no screenshots or any official info has surfaced online at the time, nor was it shown at any game conventions. It was often debated whether or not it was supposed to be a tech demo that was testing the N64 hardware or if it was actually going to be released. The game would eventually be cancelled and instead reworked into Pokemon Puzzle League, which would be released in 2001, exclusively in North America. The Game Boy Color version of Pokemon Puzzle Challenge would include unused assets of characters from Panel de Pond hidden within the ROM, implying that it was also originally going to be a Panel de Pond game under the name Panel de Pond Game Boy and would have been released alongside the Nintendo 64 release as they used the redesigns from that version. It was suspected that the version of Panel de Pond used in the Japan exclusive Nintendo Puzzle Collection was the unreleased Nintendo 64 game, as the Dr. Mario port in the collection was identical to Dr. Mario 64, which was only released in America in 2001. In July 2020, the YouTube user Gamers Manuel discovered a prototype cartridge of the Nintendo 64 version and uploaded the video to his channel showcasing it. It confirms that the unreleased game is identical to the version released on Nintendo Puzzle Collection, the only differences being its title screen and the Nintendo logo splash screen which says pre-beta version 76. As of 2023, the game has not yet been dumped online, despite the owner being interested in dumping it. Laser Clay Shooting System Did you know Nintendo made a clay shooting game? Cause I didn't. In the 1960s, bowling had become quite the fad in Japan, 
However, like all fads, its popularity faded away, and many bowling alleys across Japan were abandoned by 1971. Looking to make new use of these facilities, Hiroshi Yamauchi, president of Nintendo, began devising concepts for a new game to be hosted in these buildings. In the early 1970s, Nintendo was largely a toy company, but was venturing into other industries. Yamauchi's idea became known as the Laser Clay Shooting System. It can be said that this game was Nintendo's first venture into the video game industry. Although it wasn't truly a video game. Instead of electronic video, it projected film. Players would stand in a long line holding light guns. Targets, in this case clay pigeons, were projected from the film onto the back of the wall of the former bowling alley and players would aim at and shoot them. A computer would calculate whether a player hit the target or not. Despite technical problems, such as a computer breaking down and Genyo Takeda having to add up the player scores himself, it was quite the success and inspired Nintendo to get into arcade gaming. However, when the 1973 oil crisis hit, Japan cut back on amenities and clients began cancelling their orders. However, Nintendo eventually designed a smaller arcade cabinet sized model known as Mini Laser Clay and made several new games based on it such as 1974's Wild Gunman. No known instances of laser clay shooting system are either operational or intact today, and the game is completely lost to time. This next tier is the sixth tier, and is titled, Bro, Go Outside. If you have heard of the lost media in this tier, I strongly encourage you to walk outside and touch some grass. There is more to life than finding the lost dub of an episode of a show that you will never want to watch, Kowloon's Gate. Kowloon's Gate is a 1996 PlayStation first-person adventure game created by Sony Music Japan, released exclusively in Japan. It features FMV cutscenes through a cyberpunk take on the historic Kowloon city in Hong Kong. The game was a hit in Japan, even sparking a real-life amusement complex recreated and modelled after the look of the game. An English trailer for the game surfaced, originating from disc number 94 of Ultra Game Players magazine, suggesting that an English localization was planned. Some people report that only 20 to 30 translated copies ever existed. Either way, no English copies of the game have ever surfaced, and the localization is lost. Around the World with Willy Fogg Lost Dub Around the World with Willy Fogg is a 1983 animated adaptation of Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days. The show was co-produced by BRB International and Nippon Animation and was ultimately broadcast worldwide and dubbed in multiple languages. In Japan, the show was titled Anime Around the World in 80 Days and was broadcast on TV Asahi from October 1987 to March 1988. The Japanese version has remained quite obscure over the years. The first episode of the series was discovered online through Yahoo Japan's GYAO streaming service and has been uploaded to Dailymotion. The entire first season has since been added as well, and the entire season is now available to view and is no longer lost. Sorba Castle Pucci Sorba Castle Pucci, also known as Freckle Pucci, is an anime created by Takashi Aoki and produced by Fuji TV Enterprise. The series aired on Fuji TV in Japan every Monday through Saturday from March 31st to October 4th, 1964 for a total of 162 episodes. The series follows the adventures of a little boy named Poochie, who goes on adventures fighting bad guys with the help of a talking parrot and a friendly monster. The show had a total of 27 storylines, split into six cliffhangers. After its initial airing, the series never re-aired on any other network in Japan and has never received a home media release. Every single episode is very rare nowadays and no footage can be found anywhere online except for the opening and ending song. It's currently unknown if the original film reels to any of the episodes are still around but until we find some, Sobakasu Puchi will remain lost for the foreseeable future. Taiyo Sentai, Sun Vulcan. Apparently, the Power Rangers TV show was going to be created by Stan Lee with the help of Marvel before the Japanese TV show was made. In the 1970s, Marvel made a deal with Toei, the production company behind the Super Sentai series. Stan Lee saw an opportunity to bring back the Sentai concept to America, and in exchange, he lent some of Marvel's most iconic comic book characters, such as Spider Man and Captain America, to Toei to create shows around. Marvel and Toei's deal created four shows 
including a Japanese adaptation to Spider-Man, plus three Sentai series called Battle Fever J, Denshi Sentai Denjiman, and Taiyo Sentai Sun Vulcan. However, the deal went no further, following the relative failure of the Spider-Man adaptation. Stan Lee was hesitant to give Toei further Marvel characters, and the attempt to adapt Sun Vulcan for an American audience failed. This left Marvel and Toei's deal to expire. Originally, there were two rumors to what the pilot was. One rumor was that it was much like Power Rangers, as in, it used footage from the original show, but there were American actors and different storylines. Another rumor suggested that it was just simply an English dub. The second rumor was proven to be true through an article found on Fortune.com's archives. This newspaper is the only solid evidence we have that there was a pilot, but other than that, the pilot remains completely lost. Heavyweight Champ Heavyweight Champ was an arcade game, released in October of 1976 by Sega in Japan. This game was noteworthy for being regarded as the first game in the fighting genre. The arcade machine had one boxing glove for both players protruding from it that acted loosely like a joystick. The arcade game itself featured monochrome graphics with two similar looking characters on opposite ends. The joystick-like controllers would perform a different move depending on what direction the stick was moved. The game was remade in 1987, which proved to be popular, thus overshadowing the original into obscurity. There's little footage of the game in action online, with the only known gameplay footage sourced from an American news report from 1977. For a time, there was also no known instances of the surviving cabinet, however, a thread was started on the forms of killer list of video games on February 13th, 2018, looking for information about the game, in which a photo of the cabinet, albeit with a smashed glass bezel, surfaced. The photo supposedly originated from a Yahoo Japan auction page, but no source was given, nor was any information given on the cabinet's functional condition, though it appears to have suffered some signs of exposure and possible weather damage, and is thus likely not in working order. While the whereabouts of this particular machine is unknown, it does mean that there is potentially at least one cabinet still in existence. The seventh and final tier of this iceberg is titled, What are you doing with your life? Seriously, get a job, go get a partner, get married and have kids. Stop researching lost Japanese dubs of Spanish cartoons no one cares about. Leave your house, Kuri Kuri Golf in Koro Koro Island. Kuri Kuri Golf in Koro Koro Island is a mobile Japan exclusive golf spin off of the adventures of Cookie and Cream, or Kuri Kuri Mix as it was known outside of America. The game also had its own dedicated website, which is now unfortunately defunct. According to the description on the website, the game was quite simple, advertising the ability to play with one hand and with only two playable characters, those being Cookie and Cream. The game supposedly has a side-scrolling appearance, with 3D models and four welds to golf in, with 18 holes in each. It also boasts online compatibility, in a form for an online ranking for all over the country. Notably, the site has a list of phone models that the game was compatible with, however the list was changed as the site got updated. Besides this website and a few screenshots, this game is completely lost. Zeta's Horror Tour 3 Labyrinth, or the third game in the Horror Tour series, is a very rare Japanese PC game released by Caravan Interactive sometime in the span of 1996 to 1998. The first game, Horror Tour, was available for the Sega Saturn and PC and came to the West under the name Zedas, Servant of Xiao. In it, you are trapped in a castle and your goal is to solve puzzles and eventually find the evil demon Zedas and kill him, freeing everyone in the process. The second game, Horror Tour 2, was only released for PC in Japanese. It itself was lost until 2014. In the game, you have escaped the castle, but Zedas has been revived by evil followers. It's less puzzle oriented and there is a combat system and it's a lot more diverse than the first game in that there's so much more areas to explore. If you get the good ending, the game ends on a cliffhanger and you are transported to Zeta's Labyrinth. Not much is known about the plot and gameplay of Labyrinth. The old website of Caravan Interactive claims that the game has more than 20 puzzles and talks about a fairy girl named Ripple. The exact release date is not known, as the website page said 1996, but the back of the cover seen on Amazon Japan says 1998. It is known that Labyrinth was once sold on Yahoo Auctions Japan in 2005. 
Moreover, a Japanese PC game seller claimed to have seen it multiple times before Labyrinth would eventually be leaked from a mega folder called Do Not Upload on a private torrent site due to the concerns about the original collector not wanting the folder to be released and threatening to take it down if anyone were to leak Labyrinth. It was kept secret until YouTube user Saint uploaded the game himself onto YouTube. Pinch and Punch Pinch and Punch is a gag anime series created by Takashi Aoki and produced by Fuji TV Enterprise. The series aired on Fuji TV in Japan every Monday through Saturday from September 29, 1969 to March 28, 1970 for 156 episodes. It was the successor to Sobakatsu Puchi, the lost anime that was mentioned earlier in the last year. Most of the staff on that show continued to work on Pinch and Punch. Pinch and Punch are two modern day twins who have a particular gift for mischief and pranks. With the help of their girlfriend Dotako and their sister Chibigon and their pet pig Ijibuta, they think up and carry out all manner of hijinks. Victims of their pranks include their nagging mother Mamagon, two-faced adults, and brainiacs who do nothing but study. Like Takashi Aoki's other series, Sobakasu Puchi, the series never re-aired on any other network in Japan and never received a home media release. Only one still image and a bit of information here and there of the anime series have surfaced online, but other than that, the anime remains completely lost. Wow, you made it to the end. That's quite impressive. I fucking hate doing outros. I, I don't know what to fucking say. Uh, thanks for watching the video. If you liked it, subscribe and like, because that really helps. Uh, thank you to my, to my Patreons. Y'all are very, very epic. Thank you, Bunny Walk. Thank you, Gange Mendon. And thank you, Too Funny, Too Cool. And thank you to you for watching. I hope you you had fun listening to me ramble. And uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll see you around, I guess.